Leadership Forum, and we are happy that you have us. And today we're excited to have Pasha Carter, Andre Wells, Kenny Hamilton, and Mina Wright is um, my co-host here. And we know we were expecting Shirley Ralph to join us today. Unfortunately, um, you know, actress life, um, she's not going to be able to join us, but we will still have um, a great conversation. And we encourage you to, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard, but Moesha is coming to Netflix. And, um, you know, she was the mother, D on that show. So we encourage you guys to check it out and look at um, Diva Simply Singing as well for some other things that she's going to be doing there. But we are going to have a, um, a great conversation here today. And we thank everyone for joining us. Um, and just to go over a couple of housekeeping um, items, uh, we will be ending the webinar at 4 p.m. So at 3.45, we'll be taking Q&A from the audience. So we, um, if you have any questions while the webinar is going on that you want to direct to anyone in particular, please um, hit the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and put your questions there. And then we'll be taking those uh, around 3.45. So um, I do want to welcome, uh, I'll start with Kenny Hamilton. Um, Kenny. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> You can, oh, uh, I have to get my bio. Sorry, <laughs> I thought you were gonna see you said say something else. Uh, well, thank you, uh, William and Mina. I appreciate you um, having me on. Uh, my name is Kenny Hamilton. I am a entertainment manager uh, focusing in music. Um, also dabbling in hospitality, hospitality a little bit. Um, and I live in Los Angeles, California. Originally born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, and I've been in uh, California now almost ten years. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm here to run my mouth, you know, I like to talk sometimes, so. <laughs> He's downplaying his accomplishments, though. <laughs> but we'll learn a little bit about him. No, no, for sure. No, I, I, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I've, you know, been in the business uh, six, 16 years now um, from when I first started. And, um, you know, I've been on a, a really great journey. I uh, own my own management company, uh, CSH Management Group. Um, the CSH is not short for cash is actually my uh, son's initials because um, everything I build, I build for, you know, the future and the family to, to give him a foundation. So um, that's been the vision for everything that I've set forth. Love that. Love that. Great. Um, and then next we have uh, Pasha Carter. Pasha, if you could tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Yes, my name is Pasha Carter. I actually am an entrepreneur. I'm an uh, on the Forbes expert panel where I contribute to Forbes magazine as well as medium and thrive global. I'm in the process of launching my own magazine and I started out as an entrepreneur at 23 years old and I'm best known, I guess, for taking a $500 investment and turning it into a multi-million dollar business in my twenties. And in my twenties, I got started in business and started to really understand the concept of being able to do everything digitally and online and being able to build a, a, a business from literally from my phone. And so now since then, I've traveled the world and really teaching people how to monetize their brands, how to build a business online, and most importantly, how to capitalize on the digital world. Awesome. That sounds amazing. Um, and then we also have Andre Wells with us today. And Andre, if you can give us um, a brief bio about um, who you are and what you do as well. You're on mute. Unmute yourself, Andre. Andre, unmute. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hello, uh, LA. <laughs> uh, William and Mina, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, Andre Wells here. I have an event design and planning firm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we've worked throughout the United States and abroad. The firm is 17 years old uh, this past April. So uh, we produce large scale events, corporate, political, social, and then we do, um, let's say, uh, weddings. We do weddings also. And uh, the event firm specializes in um, kind of, let's say, high touch clients. Um, love what we do. I'm not going to list all of the things that we've done, but um, I'm very excited about the conversation here today. 
Awesome. Thank you. We're glad to have all of you guys. Thank you guys for all being here with us today. Um, and then I'm Mina Wright. I am the CEO of Wright Productions, also co-founder of The Black Table. And then we have William P. Mill. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. You can laugh at me. We kind of had a little show before the show. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we have William P. Mill William P. Miller, um, who is also one of the co-founders co of The Black Table. See, Kenny even got me all tongue-tied. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so um, thanks, Mina. And so we just want to tell you about the Black, a little bit about the Black Table. The Black Table is a collective organization of event professionals, and our purpose is to elevate the presence and positioning of event professionals worldwide. Um, we've been in existence for over a year, and our momentum is growing, and we encourage you guys to, to join up the movement. Follow us at, at the black table underscore. And so um, in the special events industry, we're just gonna sort of dive right into something that happened yesterday as well as in today and Andre was involved. Um, as we all know that just a little bit of a background is that, you know, we're going through COVID and in the event industry, we, you know, plan sporting events, we plan galas, we plan conferences, conventions, weddings, all type of social events that people travel to. And one of the things that happened when COVID um, came about is that the travel airlines were bailed out by the government. Unfortunately, the event industry, you know, didn't receive any benefits. We've been overlooked. Although we hired so many people, so many jobs were affected. And a big part of that was because we operate independently. And unfortunately, we're not necessarily a community until now. So, um, and we're starting to see some change and some coalitions being organized. We want um, African Americans to really get involved in these coalitions because we're not really, really represented. So Andre, can you tell us a little about, about the event that took place yesterday and some of the things that you're seeing happening in the event industry? Sure, so here in Washington, uh, actually it was the brainchild of another event planner, his name was Roger White. Uh, he called about seven of us who have businesses that are based here in Washington, D.C. And he said, you know, it's, it's tough times right now and we all need to bond together and really kind of, you know, see what each other are up to and going to. So that's kind of how it, just, the, it started, just kind of as a support group. And then once we were about three weeks into this thing, COVID that is, and it seemed like it wasn't <laughs> moving, we were like, we really have to, um, think about how we're gonna navigate this industry and, and what we're gonna do. Uh, so we kept talking and then we started helping each other and then we started reaching out to other uh, people in the events industry, hoteliers, catering companies, venues, uh, AV sound and lighting companies, other producers and designers and uh, food service organizations, the convention center. So now we're a group of about a uh, thousand. And um, we do a call every Tuesday and we just update each other. We've been a resource. We've been uh, helping each other about with resources from loans and grants and um, the status of certain businesses and how we could help and, and how people were pivoting. Uh, and then we had all of the uh, social um, justice and um, Black Lives Matter unrest. So then we were hit with something else. And then we decided, you know what? Our industry is racially divided. Um, it's, it's not a lot of Black event producers and uh, people in special events don't get the same opportunities. So then a whole nother conversation started happening. And so I said, uh, we, we can't rush this. This needs to be a conversation that we have over um, a period of time. And if that's a year, two years, three years, we have to continue to talk about it, but not only talk about it, we have to act on it. So um, then there was a live coalition, live entertainment coalition form. And that's from producers of concerts, parades, everything. Anytime you go to an event or think about events, um, it includes all of these people 
from these uh, other industries. Well, we looked around and the events industry also can be kind of a gig economy. You know, a lot of people are 1099, we have seasonal employees. Sometimes we have different seasons that work as high and sometimes it's low. So a lot of people weren't qualifying for um, some of the grants and loans and the unemployment. So it was a lot to, and it's been a lot to maneuver and manage. So that's really kind of the job of the coalition. Um, what we've done over the last week and at the event that William was talking about, that was today and last night, we did this event on the National Mall called the Empty Event. Basically, we set up about 48 tables that represents 250,000 people that are out of work in our community and represents 12 million people, you know, nationwide. And we wanted to make a, a statement, you know, what they say, I can, you know, I can show you better than I can tell you. So on the National Mall, we did a beautiful all out event with a stage, lights, and video, tables, chairs, restrooms. We had, you know, there was no restroom attendant because they can't work. So we wanted to stress the Congress and Senate, listen, we can't work. You know, we can't get paid. People have families to support. People have fleets of trucks and warehouses. You know, we need help. So what we're doing is in essence, lobbying for, for support. And that's how that kind of started. We did one yesterday and uh, today, and then on Saturday, I think New York did one, and then uh, Texas did one. So we're encouraging all of the states to form these coalitions and let your local politicians and the national ones know we need their help. We need legislation. We need to be included. Uh, and that's kind of how that started, and that's what we've been doing. Andre, can you talk about the, um, the hashtags that um, are being used and they're encouraging um, event professionals to create a message with the attached hashtags? Yeah, so we did this whole, um, and we've been working with um, this great firm, uh, and it's called Wish I Was There, hashtag Wish I Was There. Well, and we'll do a red screen and then we'll do a black and white screen. The first screen is the red screen may be, oh, while you miss weddings and the black and white screen, next screen may say, we miss our paychecks. <laughs> the next screen may say, while you miss meetings, in-person meetings, we miss healthcare. So, uh, just to let people know how it really affects, because so much of what we do is behind the scenes. People don't see the person that's setting up the tables and chairs and vacuuming the ballroom uh, or setting up the AV and sound. Um, they only see kind of the, the end product. But we uh, needed people to see. That's why hashtag wish I was there. Hashtag save live events hashtag save events. So all of these hashtags, and I'm um, happy for you all to go to a DC Events Coalition website and the Live Events Coalition website. I don't know if you can, I'll type it over in the uh, we get that uh, chat section. So you'll have, and the hashtags as well, so you'll know where to go right. with that. That's, that's actually um, awesome, um, Andre, because we need that. And you know, our topic today is like um, reinventing yourself for success. And that's a great start for um, our industry of, of reinventing, um, basically working independently and coming together as a community because we're um, stronger, you know, united than we, than we are divided. Right. And what do they say? Closed mouths don't get fed. You have to be able to lobby for yourself. You know, having, you know, as a benefit of living in Washington, I'm around so many lobbyists and so many people. And that's what we have to do. We have to lobby for ourselves. We have to bring attention. Our industry, we make so many people happy. And right. life starts with an event from the right. birth of a baby to the end of your life. It's right. all about special events. And, um, you know, we have to remember the people that keep the the world moving. Right. I, you're absolutely right. That's, that's great. Um, Kenny, did you have any, or Pastor, you have anything to chime in on that? 
Oh. So you... Tosh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, no, I mean, uh, I didn't have too much, uh, you know, we were speaking earlier, I was just saying from the touring industry aspect of it, from a music standpoint, um, there are like Live Nation was one of the first companies that started a, a fund for uh, the touring personnel. Like, you know, a lot of times when you go to a concert, you don't understand that, you know, a load in for a show, especially a big show at an arena, say, per se, they might have 120 employees that are moving on that sh on that tour everyone from the truck drivers to the riggers to the electricians to the uh the pyrotechnicians the you know the sound engineers and this is outside of you know what's considered the a party of just the artists and their crew right um and so these people have you know i know many people who literally live on the road they hop from tour to tour you know it might be the weekend it might be tim mcgraw it might be you know different genres it doesn't matter because these people all do that same job of stage building and things of that nature. So um, there hasn't been any government in uh, help with that as well as, you know, with the events and, you know, events is a broad spectrum of different things. And, you know, concerts are also events, right? Live events. Um, and there hasn't, you know, what Andre was saying is completely right. So it's great that he's on the ground in DC with a lot of other people that are, you know, hopefully being able to get that, that message out as, you know, the Grammy foundation started, uh, through their music cares they've been you know donating to other folks that i've done some stuff with some of my artists with uh in the past few months during the covid uh crisis and this pandemic so it's uh yeah it's really um it's a it's a tough time right now for everyone but i think we just keep pushing through right great great so pastor you um as you said you coach entrepreneurs and you've been an entrepreneur for for several years lots of success and you sort of slipped in you took five hundred dollars and created a multi-million dollar company. <laughs> so you can sort of slip that in. But in, in the time of, um, when we talk about reinventing yourself, where do we start in terms of, when do we know it's time to reinvent yourself? Or what, what should we be looking for of, of cues that it might be time to do different? Is it that you're, you're tired, you're not motivated? Or you know, what, what clues as, as individuals that we should look for when it might be time to do so and what tips could you give or have you given to people of what actions that they could take well one thing that i've learned um and that i embrace is constant change you know the one thing that i say is always constant is change and so when it comes to reinventing yourself when do you know that's important all the time um and the the one thing that i will say is anytime the biggest opportunities happen when there's a downturn. So right now, in the, with the economy being where it is, with times being where they are, there's so much opportunity out there and there are gonna be two types of people. They're gonna be the people that, you know, treat this like a cocoon and they're gonna come out a butterfly and they're gonna understand that it's gonna take pain, it's gonna take growth, it's going to, you can either uh, panic or pivot. And those are the choices that we have. And some people are panicking and some people are pivoting. And I'm around all of, uh, you know, everything in between. And so one of the things that I've learned is in a time like this, uh, going from physical to digital and understanding how does that work in your space, whatever your space is, how do you take whatever your craft is and figure out how you can monetize it in a different way. Um, I always tell people, if you can figure out what your skill and talent is, and find multiple ways to monetize whatever that skill is. And sometimes people find that hard, like, well, you know, this is what I do. And in order for me to do this, I've been doing it this way for so many years. Well, mm -hmm. when times change and things change, then we're forced to either change with the time or we get left behind. Right. And so I was teaching and coaching a young lady who um, travels with speakers and that's what she does. So when we speak, you know, I go out and that's what I've done all my life. I get on the road and I speak to, you know, conventions filled with people and on entrepreneurship, leadership and things like that. So when COVID hit, a lot of speakers, many of them panicked, but there were many of us that decided to pivot. So this young lady that I was talking to, she's the one that when we go as a speaker, she shows up and her staff handles everything. You know, when you walk in, your, your, your tables are set up, your booth is set up in the back. She handles everything for the speaker. So all we have to do is focus on speaking. So she called me and she was just so down and out. And I said, listen, do you realize that right now you realize what an opportunity you have? 
because every speaker is trying to figure out how to go digital with their message and monetize it. If mm -hmm. you can take exactly what you've done for all of us for the past several years, and now you flip it and you start to hire people who can help people understand how do you do a Zoom call? How do you monetize a Zoom call? How do you get your audience on to make it feel like it's live? How do you now do all of the things that most of these people like myself and many other speakers that were in the speaker arena, they were still trying to figure this out. And I said, and if you can now shift and don't worry about what happened, but shift right now and take that same message you have and make it digital, you can literally 10 X your income. And so she started doing that. And lo and behold, she started reaching out to people to show people, how do you create a funnel to be able to get a mat to attract masses to an online meeting versus a mm -hmm. vir versus a um, physical meeting. And mm -hmm. so now that's what she's doing. But what happened is in the beginning, she was so down, but she realized that just like all of us, you either are going to panic or you're going to pivot. And that's going to determine where you are in the next five or 10 years. Wow. And yeah, that's, that was, those are some really amazing points, um, Pasha. We actually had the same type of situation where, you know, we had a choice to either panic or pivot, um, you know, with the, our, essentially our business not existing after COVID um, and we decided to pivot to providing um, rest lounges for hospital workers for first responders so it was like let's take our skill and do something that we can you know still monetize but we're also doing good and we're answering a need that you know needed to be filled and still needs to be filled with you know cases going up um, Penny this actually is a good opportunity, I think, where you can kind of talk through, um, you've worn, worn like many hats um, from being a radio personality to going into music marketing to now having your own firm where you're managing artists and you're in the hospitality industry, but you're also a social media influencer. And you have like, you know, over 900,000 followers on Instagram and over a million followers on Twitter. Um, can you talk through like how people can use this time right now to reinvent themselves in to, to Pasha's point in the digital space, um, you know, you, using social media and like what tools did you use to be able to um, reinvent yourself in the multiple ways that you have over the course of your career? Um, there, there's a few, a few different things. One is, you know, when, before social media became what it was, uh, I think we had first joined Twitter. When I say we have some friends of mine in 2008, um, before Twitter was a thing. And, you know, my social media following, I'm in a unique uh, situation because early on when I first started, you know, like, I, yeah, I was a radio personality, but at the same time, I was working at T-Mobile during the day, right? Uh, my first, when I, I was in the military after I dropped out of college and went to the Navy. And then when I got out the Navy, I moved back to Atlanta. Um, and when I got out, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to have a career in the music industry. I wanted to be an exec. I was, you know, motivated by a few things. Um, early on, I kind of back up a little bit. I actually went to school to be a sports agent. Like Jerry Maguire, the film changed my life. Yeah. I, I saw that because growing up in the east side of Atlanta, there were a lot of things that you didn't necessarily see, especially growing up in black neighborhoods, right? Like we know athletes and we know like rich people. There was, you know, I would watch the lifestyles of the rich and famous or Robin Leach, but there was no in between. You didn't know like, who, how did they get here? Who helped them? Any jobs and things like that. Um, and those are things that you just really didn't think about. Um, so when I went to college, I, I, like I said, I dropped out, ended up going into the Navy and then September 11th happened and we were in the war for a while. And so when we got out, I moved back to Atlanta early 2004, but I knew what I wanted to do. I'd read a book um, that Kevin Lyles wrote called Making It Happen. And he described mm. his journey of wanting an internship and before he really got in with Russell Simmons and those guys and, you know, the Leo Cohen's and that whole New York movement and, you know, Kevin being from Baltimore, how he just kind of hustled and did whatever he could. And that was always in the back of my mind. Um, in college, my freshman year, I had a radio show because I went to a predominantly white school in Nashville, uh, Lipscomb University. And all I heard was like country music and all this other stuff. So I was like, I want to play my music. Obviously I couldn't play like hip hop and, you know, Master P, No Limit stuff. This is 99, 2000. Um, but I played R&B stuff, you know, but I had fun doing it. And I was like, oh, I could kind of get used to doing this. Um, and so fast forward, when I get back to Atlanta, I'm trying to figure out how do I get into business? How do I meet people? 
And I saw at one club, every radio station in the city, the hip hop stations and the pop stations all did a live broadcast from this club called Vision. And so I was like, well, if I get there, maybe I can meet somebody. So what I did was um, I got a job as, at a security company that did the security for that club. Um, and that's how I started meeting people. So I met the folks at the radio stations in Atlanta and I said, all right, let me figure this out, how I can get an internship. So I called, you know, the big hip hop station, which was V103 there, had to be in school, so I couldn't go there. Uh, the other station, Hot, Hot 107, they never called me back. And the, the pop station Q100, they were like, sure, come on in. You know, so I came in and I, I was brought on as a promotion intern. I had to do three events a week um, to maintain my internship. And at the same time, I ended up getting a job at T-Mobile um, to just help, you know, save some money and be able to pay, you know, what bills I had. But with that internship, I did five, six, seven events a week. And I made sure that everyone in that building knew my name, knew my face. Um, you know, I, I tried to go over and beyond. If there was the littlest thing that needed to be done, I was going to volunteer to do it. Mm. Um, because I knew that I, I thought in my head, and this was my plan, that if I can get a job in radio, I'll have something on my resume to add as an experience with music to be able to take to a label or to any other situation. Um, not knowing that, you know, six months later I got hired and I was hosting our Saturday night mix show um, before the live broadcast at Vision now. So everything's coming back full circle because now I'm going in as one of the hosts and with the, the night jock that I was with and we were hosting a Saturday night party that I was once a, a security guard at. Um, and so just through that, and that, that helped me transition because, and I'm gonna get to the social media part, but that helped me transition because the night jock that was there, Jeff Miles, who I'm still very close to to this day, um, he gave me an opportunity to be an intern on his show. So now I'm talking on the radio, I'm not getting paid yet, but I'm talking on the radio five nights a week, and then I'm getting paid to host the Saturday night show. So now I'm becoming, a, you know, I'm meeting a lot of the DJs, a lot of the guys that you know now, like DJ Drama, Canon, uh, you know, a lot of people were just still coming up. We all kind of came up together. Mm -hmm. um, and throughout that time, the jock that I was with, Jeff Miles, he was friends with Jermaine Dupree. And Jermaine came up to the station one day uh, and brought, you know, five or six people that all worked for So So Deaf at the time. And they all came up into the station. And what do I do? Hey, I'm Kenny, introducing myself, meeting everybody. Um, and that's when I met my now best friend, um, Scooter Braun, who was head of marketing at So So Deaf then. And, you know, I was found out who the marketing person and the street team guy was, which is this guy, Mel Testamark. And I said, hey, you know, you guys need any interns or can I come by the office to just kind of see how the operation goes? And he was like, sure. And so then I started interning at SoSo Deaf about a week later. And so I'm interning at the radio station at SoSo Deaf and I'm working at T-Mobile during the day. This is, you know, when the sidekicks and the Blackberries and everything were out. Um, and that's really how I started getting in because I was willing to do anything and everything to just pivot. If I need to go over here, I mean, we were climbing telephone poles, putting up posters, you know, when records were coming out. Um, at this time, it was the, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, that. it was a song, Oh, I Think They Like Me with J.D. DeBrat Bow Wow. That was the first record I worked. And this is when we still printing CDs. Um, and through this time, Scooter and I started, you know, hanging out. We were, he would just dropped out of Emory, but he had been, you know, somewhat successful in music at this point. And, he was managing a rap group and I was like, you know, I really want to kind of help, you know, whatever I can with this group um, from the Southwest side of Atlanta. So I started working with him with that. And that's how we started having a working relationship outside of just, uh, you know, being friends and hanging out and being able to see and go and like, you know, I would go into the hood and get a thousand CDs printed up and we're going to every club in the city, every, you know, Atlanta is a, is, is a strip club culture. And people, mm -hmm. you know, us, you probably all saw the whole Lou Williams situation when he went and got wings from Magic City. But like, that's a part of our culture. Like if I go hang out and get a drink, I'm going to Magic or somewhere else. And that's just kind of like the culture of Atlanta. But what's not talked about is records break in strip clubs in Atlanta before they hit the radio. Oh. You got to break in a strip club before you break in a regular club because <laughs> so many artists, so many people come through. So like I would get, I would make friends with some of the strippers because when they had their sets <laughs> on the big nights, they play on my records. So, got it. Got it. And that, that was a whole thing because if the clubs aren't playing your records, then the radio is not playing your records in Atlanta. And Atlanta has been the mecca of like, you know, urban music for God knows how long now since the days of Outkast. Mm. Um, and so, you know, throughout my relationship with Scooter, 
uh, I got into more artist management. I left T-Mobile, was at CarMax selling cars. I always kept some type of job to be able to pay. Just reinventing yourself. Pretty yeah, and, and as Scooter said, always he said, ever since he's known me, I've always had six jobs. So, yeah. you know, it was just like whatever I could, um, whatever I could do to, you know, to keep the momentum going or to just learn, like if it was, if I had to go climb a pole and do this or run over here and do this, there were many nights where, you know, I stayed in this uh, little roach infested uh, apartment in Buckhead called the Darlington. It was $500 a month. And um, literally like I would get out the car in the back parking lot, there would be, you know, crack vials in the, in the, in the parking lot and needles and just, you know, it was just really bad, but I didn't care because I was in the city you know, I would be, you know, running around clubs at night. I would go back to my place, shower, put my uniform on, drive to, you know, the, the store where I had to work the next morning at 8 a.m., sleep in the car for an hour, open the store, keep going. Like, we were just doing that because I saw something bigger for myself. And I saw, I didn't know how it was going to be, but I saw it, right? And so the social media part started coming in because back then it was just MySpace. And wow. Scooter found this one artist from Canada and he was you know could sing really well and I was like man this dude is incredible and you know he sent me this video and I remember I put this video of, on my MySpace page and it was a 12 year old Justin Bieber singing Stevie Wonder Sunday at Christmas and everyone used to tell me like oh like oh that little white boy like you know he can't see you know oh it's cool oh, cool okay but now it's everybody's like oh man I remember when y'all was doing this and doing that and you know, Justin was the first person that we really saw the power of social media because on Twitter, as he started getting uh, bigger, he had fan pages. He was the first artist that really had fan pages on mm. social media. And we saw that there were kids in Brazil and Europe that was loving his YouTube videos. And now, obviously, everybody's on YouTube, right? Everyone's doing covers and, you know, things of that nature. And this is all where it really came from. Um, and we started then. And so, you know, we call it the Bieber effect, which is why my social media got so big because these kids follow anything attached to him. Um, and as Justin grew, I first came on, um, it's a funny story as far as, you know, pivoting as Pasha was saying earlier, um, because I always wanted to be a road manager, uh, you know, and just jump in and go for it. And Scooter had signed this one artist, Asher Roth, that we had a lot of success with. Um, I asked him, I said, Hey, I want to be a road manager, but he already had two friends of his that he wanted to work with him. So I just helped wherever I could get our singles out to the DJs. You know, we were doing mixtapes and things like that because I was building a network. I would always try to have one piece of something to help me in the next level. Right. So mm -hmm. it's radio. Now I know how program directors think. I know what music directors do. So when I'm managing artists now, I already know who not to waste time with. I know exactly who to go to. I know exactly what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, but Scooter called me one day and he asked me to come over to his place in, uh, in Buckhead. And he was like, yo, we got to find a security person for Justin. And I was like, okay, because he was 14, 15 at the time. We had just started working his first single, but he had got tackled. He was like 4'10". And he got tackled by an overzealous fan who was just running, this girl was just running to hug him. And she was just tall. She was taller than he was at the time, right? right? And I was like, yeah, I know plenty of guys. I know, you know, I started naming folks. I was like, you know, you want me to call me? He's like, no, I want you to do it. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to wow. be a roadman. And, wow. you know, at the time, it was our buddy Ryan who had worked with Usher, but Usher fired him from being his assistant. But Usher was like, yo, he's a great guy. He's just not fit to be my assistant. Right. So right. he was like, let's put him with Justin. So he was taking Justin to his, you know, his, his uh, studio sessions and things like that early on. And, you know, the way Scooter had broke it down to me, he was like, look, he was like, we have something special here. I see what it can be, mm -hmm. um, but I want to keep our team very close and I want to keep it with people that we can trust. Because in our business, if you have an artist that's taken off like that, I mean, you got every top manager at that time in the world that was trying to take him from, him, right? Wow. They were trying to come in and poach him. You know, I think we all have been in a business or industry where another company comes and tries to poach business from you at that wow. time. And that happened to us when Justin was first starting out. So I was yeah. going to say that, that could, that's kind of something that um, we experience as well in the special events industry. And as a result, um, it seems like you and Scooter has developed a relationship and um, you, you almost have come together to, to make a goal. But there's a couple of things I heard that you said is one is that you made sure that everyone knew who you were. And right. I guess, which means that you made yourself approachable. Right. Um, 
And then you also said that you did anything that needed to be done. And you also said that it was not always for pay. And right. in our industry, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot a little bit to Andre on this here, because um, we know that a lot of people come into the special events and they want to be planners or whatever, they want to be paid, but yet they haven't you know, done the work or they haven't done the experience. They're not really, especially the newer generation, um, they're not really um, trying to learn or be of service to someone. And then, so and Andre, I'm sure, can you talk a little bit about the importance of people paying their dues? But more importantly, one of the things he said, like in our industry, we've sort of operated like crabs in a barrel, but the importance of community over competition. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Jenny, that's quite a story, man. I love, I love, <laughs> love hearing your come up. Yeah. It's, it's great, it's very inspiring too, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think it's a lot of people that want to be Kenny, but they don't want to go through Kenny's life experience, <laughs> which have contributed to where he is now, right? Right. And so that's what happens in our industry. You know, I always live by, right, to whom much is given, much is required. Right. So I've been blessed um, to have, uh, I've had my company now for 17 years. Um, so there are high moments and low moments, I tell people. But one of the things that I know that I'm supposed to do is help people. So I try and I do, and I've helped a lot of people. And then there's times and moments when you have to help yourself, right? And you have to be able to, to do those things. But I think as a community, um, you know, of people in general, I don't think sometimes we use our resources or we are, and, and I'm including myself in this as well, we're um, afraid to ask people um, but that, that's what we should. And we have such a talent pool of um, African-American event professionals from caterers and florists to um, builders, e everything. And I think we have to do a better job of letting people know who we are. And I like when Kenny said, he let people know who he was. You have to tell people, and that's what you do. You have to sell yourself. If you can't sell yourself, then, hey, you know, I would tell, you know, I have a small business. I didn't expect people to work for me for a long, you know, long periods because I can't offer, I'm not going to offer them a stake in the company or whatever. Um, so people like, you're not afraid of them poaching your business or I was like, well, you know what? If that client wants to go with them, they can't, they can, they can go with them. Um, you know, I believe in myself and who I am and what I have to offer and my, my skill set and, and my, my talent. But um, I would like going forward um, for us as a community, a community to be able to help each other, to be able to support each other and to be able to say, hey, I know my friend and William and I have done it for a long time. You know, I'll call and ask him about a client. Uh, what do you think about this? He'll call and ask me um, or an opportunity like, hey, William, I think this opportunity is coming up in your city. You should be. You should go after it. And he, he does the same. And I think we have to do more of that um, and, and engage. You know, we have a lot of talented athletes and entertainers. And sometimes their agents and otherwise, they send them to other people. But we got to get to them and let them know who we are and what we can do and the services that we offer. And here we do just, you know, because sometimes it's just about not having an opportunity or right. the right, you know, quote unquote, the right person not knowing who you are. But I think as a community, if we pull together, we can help each other. And as much as I would love to do every event that happens from the Grammys to <laughs> inauguration, I know I can't. I can't do it by myself. So I need a community. I want to be able to have a community, right. you know, right. to, to help. Right. Yeah. What if good I, is it for you to come up by yourself doing whatever in, in the yeah. community? They can't be a part of it. Could I kind of add and pivot a little bit to that as well? Because... There are like, you know, I used to, people used to be confused back in the day and it was like, oh, they thought Scooter and I were partners. No, that was his vision, but I was willing to do anything to help his vision right. because I believed in that vision. And I also knew that I needed more experience and I'm learning as well. So if I needed to be the security person, but I still made it known, hey, I want to get to this point. And so he helped me get to this point because eventually by the time Justin turned 18, I was running his touring, running 
um, you know, his day to day under Scooter and Allison, who, who is his partner, who runs his company. So anything that those two needed done, I was making sure it got done. And I was okay with that. I think a lot of times in today and like the, uh, I hate saying the younger generation, like I'm, I mean, I'll be 40 next year, but I feel like I'm 20. <laughs> but um, um, but I, there, I feel like there are, there is a, there is a, a energy among younger people that everybody wants to start and be the CEO. And right. it's okay to be the vice president and be a great vice president. It's okay to be a great operations director and running this. Like, it's okay to be in a position and focus in that and be great in it. I understand that we all want to be rich. We all want to have, you know, the biggest houses on the block and things like that. But I feel like there has to be a realistic expectation of where you are now. Focus on that, make it great and build on that greatness and at time because you know, a lot of times, and I think we all kind of fall into this. I know I did at times, but you know, you look at someone else that might be your age, you're like, damn, bro, they're doing this and I'm only over here. But it's like, no, you have to learn gratitude and to be grateful in what you've gotten to this point because you might be the Morgan Friedman and not have a career until you're 50, you know, like really blow up until you're, you know, later on in life, whereas some people got their wealth, you know, early on. But it's really important to just to be happy and find that gratitude within yourself and where you are now and to not count one, you know, we say in the, in the hip hop and it's just like, don't count other people's pockets, you know, mm -hmm. don't worry about what they're doing and focus on what you're doing. Focus right. on what you do and stay consistent with that. And mm -hmm. well, Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I was going to say, Kenny, you, you hit so many valid points because one of the things that I think a lot of people have to understand is, and you said it so eloquently is, learning every role like i think a lot of times when people show up like even in my field it's like one of those things where you want to master whatever your craft is but if you master everything around you and you understand how every aspect of your business works you're never out of business because yeah. you know and understand all of the layers and then you figure out how to monetize all those layers so that's one of the things that you hit that i think is so important because i think we're in a society uh, where it's more of a microwave mentality. Everybody wants to have success and they want it like right now because, you know, a lot of times on, you know, Facebook and Instagram, you see the end result. So everybody has the great lifestyle. Everybody's driving the car. So you're thinking in your mind, especially the younger generation, is that's what I want and I want it right now. But are they willing to put in the work to be able to do that? And mm -hmm. the, the other thing is, having that abundance mentality. You know, I think that's one of the biggest things that we as a people have to have is the abundance mentality versus having a scarcity mentality where we feel like, well, well what's mine is mine. One of the things that I, I've learned in business is I want to be a vessel. I want to, every door that I open is a pathway for somebody to walk through. Every tree that I've knocked down, every road that I've been on, and it's been hard. You know, I tell people the entrepreneur journey is not for the weak. And if you're, if you don't have strength, if you're not able to bounce back, if you're not able to fall on your back and get back up, you know, you're not designed and cut out to be an entrepreneur because it will, it will teach you what pain is. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's all about, okay, every door that I open, it's like, how long can I keep this door open? And how many of my people can I allow to walk through this door? Mm -hmm. Because my forefathers, what they went through for us to be able to have the opportunity that we have, you know, I look at my, my job and my duty and my responsibility is leaving this world better for the next generation and the next generation. So yes. I love the stuff that you said, Kenny, because it's so important us having the work ethic, us having the abundance mentality and being able to open up those doors for everybody that's willing and ready to put in the work. So, so Pat, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, Kenny, let me just ask you. So Pasha, where do you draw to, to, to keep the positive attitude? Because, you know, it's right now, you know, it, it's, it's a little tough. I mean, everybody, people dying, you can't go see them, people sick, we scared to touch, we're afraid to call. It's, it, it's tough to maintain a positive attitude. And, and, and Kenny, you know, Bash is from Atlanta. She was on the Falcon field for a number of years. And you know, and so, but it's, um, but, but how do you, Pat your own self on the back. Like I like to listen to Don, Donald Lawrence song. Sometimes you have to encourage yourself and, and that's really needed. But I would, it'd be interesting to hear that. Well, in the beginning of my business, the first thing that I did and I do it every single day, I mastered my mindset. 
That is the biggest challenge that most people have, not just in business, but in life. They, they may master their business, but if you don't master your mindset, then your business is only temporary because your business is going to change. And if your mind doesn't grow, and if you think that, I always tell people, you can't make new money with the same old mindset. So mm -hmm. for me, every single day that I wake up, it's like, okay, what am I programming my mind with? What am I listening to? How am I growing? What did I learn today? And so if I'm not learning something new, if, if I'm not growing every single day, then I'm dying. And we've got to realize that our mind is like a garden. And, and if, if we listen to a bunch of negativity, it's just weeds. And all mm -hmm. these weeds are starting to grow in your garden. And we know what happens when weeds grow. They take over the whole garden. So mm. I look at every single positive image, every single positive word, every single thing that I learn as a new seed that I'm plant planting in my mind. And so I learn all kinds of businesses. That's why when I talk to people, they ask, what do you do? Well, hell, where do I start? I've got so many different <laughs> businesses that I'm monetizing because I'm consistently planting seeds. But most importantly, as I'm planting seeds, I realize it's my responsibility to shine the light on the new and upcoming entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Because if we consistently understand the abundance mentality, which is the more that we have, the more we can serve. And mm -hmm. um, people call me an entrepreneur. And yes, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm a servant first. So when I wake up in the morning, my attitude is, okay, whose life is going to be better because I'm awake? Who am I going to help today? How am mm -hmm. I going to serve today? And what I've realized is the more that I serve, the more that I give, the more that life just opens up doors for me. And so I think that if we can kind of have that attitude of collaboration versus competition, um, mm -hmm. competing is great and that's a part of business. But when you really learn how to collaborate with people that speak like, think like, dream like, walk like you do, that's when your life starts to change. And there's no stopping you when you have that kind of circle. So true. true. So true. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy because, uh, you know, I've, I've really gotten into understanding the subconscious mindset more. Um, I've been reading a lot of books on it and I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the law of attraction and things like that. And, that's I wish I, I wish I really believed and really went into that in my twenties, but I think I did at a point, but now I feel like I'm at a, a another level of it. Um, I mean, it's, you know, before I go to sleep, I'm envisioning where I want my life to be. When I wake up, the first thing I think about is where I want my life to be. And no matter what happens, it's like, it's okay. I rub it off. You know, we adjust to it, we pivot. Um, mm -hmm. And you just know that, you know, my goal is here. I know I'm going to reach my goal. I have no doubt in my mind where I'm going to be. There's a goal for my, for my company. Every time I sign an artist, I just signed two new artists this week. There's a goal. I have to have a vision and a goal for those artists, right? Outside of, you know, just them. I, I listen to what they want and their goals. And my whole thing is also serving in a management situation because when you're a music manager, I'm a therapist. I'm a, I'm a, uh, I got to lie to, to cover up stuff half the time to, you know, I got to, I'm a protector. I'm dumb. I'm, literally I wear every hat that has to be worn um, to make sure my talent, you know, gets to the level that they want to get to whatever that, whatever that is. Um, but being able to really, you know, manifest and really see yourself and where you want to be is super important so that no matter what happens. And it's crazy because uh, Rotimi is one of my artists. He was also on the show power. Um, He's in the new uh, Coming to America Part 2 plug that's coming out uh, as well. But we had a 30-city tour planned. I had him booked on 15 different festivals, and I had to cancel everything. You know, when we were, uh, we, we did a big show in Ghana when it was the return um, uh, last uh, holiday season. You know, he had performed. It was his biggest show they ever done. It was 60,000 people um, that we had just done. And, you know, no one really took him seriously in the music world because his acting, it got so big, but no one realized that he just started acting, but he'd been singing his whole life. And, you know, when we came around to this top of this year, like everyone, we all had plans and we all, you know, set it through. And it's crazy because I sat back two days ago when we were talking and I said, as wild as this, as this year has been, and this year even took a little turn for me, I lost a friend last night who died in a car wreck and it still kind of was bothering me all morning, but as, as bad as this year has been, my goals are still being achieved. Mm -hmm. I had two goals for him, which was a new recording contract that we're about to sign, which is bigger, his biggest one he's ever signed, and a publishing deal, which is his first ever that he's ever had in his career. 
and we just pivoted. We, we pivoted. We put out an acoustic project in April that was not planned. We couldn't shoot our video. Um, I, did an, I, I hired 37 out-of-work uh, creators, and we did a big animated video that we put out in April, and our sing his single with uh, Wale that's been out right now was doing very well on radio mm -hmm. all over the country. Mm -hmm. And we literally had momentum going in a pandemic when I did a Sean John deal where he was uh, modeling Sean John suits He's on billboards all over the country and nobody can see him because they're not in their cars. And so, but you know, it was just like, we just kept pushing, kept pushing, kept pushing. And these goals are still being achieved. And when I sat back and I was really was trying to look at what had been happening throughout the year. And I was like, I'm grateful that we're just here. And I really sat back and looked and I was like, oh man, oh, we did do this. Oh, I did do this. I look back at what I wrote down, which is another thing that I never did until a few years ago, which is starting to really write down where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. So yeah, so no matter what happens, it's, it's that pivot. And Pasha, I need your number because I'm gonna have to call you every morning. <laughs> but it's, it's, literally, it's literally that energy that you put and that you plant into your, into your uh, mindset, for sure. Yeah, it is, and you know what, that's what, go ahead. I'm still, I, before you go, you mentioned that you were reading books and it helped develop your mindset. Do you mind sharing one or two books that, have, um, that, are, that you would recommend? Uh, yeah, one is called The Power of the Subconscious. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot who wrote that. I actually let a friend of mine borrow that, which she ain't brought it back yet. I got to check on that one. <laughs> and then um, another, one of my, another one of my favorite books uh, is called The Originals. Mm -hmm. um, and The Originals, I actually have it right over there because uh, I forget the author. It's, it's uh, Malcolm Gladwell, I believe. No, it's not Malcolm. Adam Grant. Sorry, Adam Grant. Adam Grant's a professor at UPenn. Um, and The Originals is about um, people taking a risk and taking a chance on doing what you want to do. So it talked about the guys who started Warby Parker, who when they were starting their company, people said that no one's going to buy glasses. How, do you, how are you going to mail people glasses? And they're like, well, we'll mail them the frames. They like the frames and then we can know what their prescription is and we'll figure out what works for them. And it took them three, four years to have that model, but they made it. And now it's a, you know, worth a company worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And uh, they wow. talked about the guys who started YouTube and, you know, those things. And it's, it's, it's about, um, you know, we come from a generation of parents and our parents before who the first job that they get, they had to get, right? Because especially, you know, being black and my father, he was from Jackson, Mississippi. So he graduated college. He's always, I listened my whole life of him saying that he wanted to be a lawyer and he wished he went to law school. Well, he took the first job offered so he could get out of Mississippi. And that first job was at Bell South, which is now AT&T. But that's not what he wanted to do. He just took a job and did it. But I always told myself that I'm not just going to take a job and just sit there. I don't mm -hmm. want a job just to be in it. I want to be happy and really go for what I'm doing. Has the road been easy? Not at all. But, you know, being consistent breeds success, I think. So, yeah. you know, just staying consistent with it and being able to pivot. And um, another book is Who Moved My Cheese, which is, talks about pivoting. One of my favorites. It really talks about that. Yeah. And, and the seven highly habits, is, I can talk all day, but yeah. sorry. But, yeah, oh, yeah, you, you're naming habits. all my favorite books too. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. You can maybe type some of them in the chat too, just so people have them that they can reference yeah. back to. Yeah. And before we get into the Q&A, I did want um, just each of you to kind of um, go around and just speak of, you know, I'm glad you uh, brought that up, William, about like what books Kenny has read to kind of help reinvent himself or help him on his path to success. Um, if you guys could just kind of maybe talk about three things that you guys have put into your daily habit um, that have helped you continue to reinvent yourselves um, and, you know, just position yourselves for, for success on your path um, or your, your career path. You guys can kind of just maybe, um, and I'll start with Pasha. Well, I do something called 10 before 10, and I've been doing this for quite some time to make myself more effective. So every night before I go to bed, I write down the 10 most important things for me to do before 10 a.m. And what I do is we all have those things that we don't want to do, but we know we need to do. And what I used to find was at the end of the day, I still have stuff on my list and I go to bed all frustrated. So I said, you know what? I need to do the 10 most important things before 10 a.m. so I can enjoy the rest of my day. So I've programmed my mind and my uh, and, and, and discipline myself to if you know that phone call that you know you need to make, but you might not want to make, get it done. That person that you need to follow up with, that email that you need to return, whatever those 10 most important things that drive revenue, um, I always do them before 10 a.m. Uh, so that's one of the things that I do in my day. The other thing is I allow myself to fail and I embrace mistakes. I tell my kids all the time, you're going to watch your mom fail 
every single day because I'm stretching, I'm growing, and I'm learning new things. I don't want you to look at me or, or look at yourself when you make a mistake as something bad. I think the one of the biggest travesties in this country is the fact that school punishes kids for making mistakes. When in reality, in order for you to succeed in life, you have to be a walking, talking mistake. That's the only way you're gonna have massive success. So for me, every single day I wake up, if I'm not messing something up, if I'm not failing, if I, that means I'm not growing, that means I'm not stretching. So that's the other thing. I don't stress about mistakes. I embrace those mistakes. And the other thing is I make sure that I'm a person who, lives in my head in the future. And this goes back to your question, William. Um, when you talked about during these times, how does someone continue to move forward? Well, what I've learned is there are three types of people. There's the person that lives in the past and they're all, they always start every conversation with remember when. Hey, hmm. remember when we used to do this or remember when this? And then you have the person who lives in the present. They talk about what's happening right now in their lives. And then you have that small group of people that they live in the future. And they're thinking about three, three, three years down the line, five years down the line, 10 years down the line. So when people say stuff to me like, Pasha, aren't you excited about where you are today? No, I was excited about where I am today, five years ago. You wait until you see where I am in five years because that's where I am. So yeah. for me, even though right now in 2020, yeah, it may suck for some people and we know that we can't change. So I don't get wound up and frustrated over stuff that I have no control over because I believe that frustration is self-inflicted. So if I can't change it, if I don't have the power to change it, I'm not going to let it change me. So for me, my mind is where I'm going to be in the next five years, all the different businesses and who I'm going to be doing it with, where we're going to be going and, you know, all of those things. So I always say to, to myself, I'm always want to be that third person where I'm living three to five years uh, in front of where I am consistently. So I would say those are the three things that I do every single day. Okay. And can I just jump in here a quick second, Mina, because I think it's important with Pat, with what she said. She's a mother of four and she manages her daughter's modeling career. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and so I think it's important to hear because I know that, you know, some parents, and I know Andre and Kenny, you both have children as well. Um, it, it's not easy to manage running a business or developing new businesses and still being the wife or being the mom, but you get it done. Yes. So bravo yeah. to that, yeah. Um, so Andre, could you expand on that a little bit um, as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, I am, um, the first thing I do is I thank God when I get up, because I'm so grateful mm -hmm. and thankful. He's provided so many wonderful blessings for me. And uh, my, my family, which I, I love, my wife and my son, and uh, that's the number one thing I do. And as I have a 15 year old son and I encourage him every day and I give him a hug because as a black man, I want to make sure that when I leave here, my son is able to function and that he is, he knows that he is love and he knows that he is all of that. And I, I just wanna make sure that I instill that into him and so, um, those are the top two things that I do each and every day. And then third, you know, I am encouraged and inspired by, by life. And, um, you know, I'm a designer, um, so I, I love beautiful things. And I found that, um, and I said this, I, so I have a love-hate relationship with COVID. Because I think what it did is it set us down and we really got to focus, you know, so I really get to focus on my today, my to do list, which I do every morning. Um, and I had given so much of myself. I think that I was tired and I needed a break from, you know, I am a public servant, you know, I, I that's what I do. So um, I have been enjoying um, this and I found out a lot about myself. And I've always been resilient, but you find out how resilient you really are. And also, you know, certain, a lot of people don't know what they're supposed to do in life, but I, I do know one of my major things that I'm supposed to do, and I always try and do, is just that whole give back element. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I make sure that um, I am constantly giving back because when we leave here, I'm not taking any of this stuff with me, but I do want to make sure that I have helped my community. 
So those are the three things that I do every day. Awesome, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, Winnie, I know, um, you know, we're gonna have to go to Q&A in a little bit, but do you wanna just jump in? I know you gave us your books that you read. Um, do yeah. you wanna give us really quickly? Um, yeah, I, I like Andre, I, I do, uh, one of the first things I do is when I wake up and I'm, um, I, I practice gratitude a lot. So, you know, I thank God for, you know, where I am now and I embrace whatever that struggle is or that stress. <laughs> Um, and also, you know, thank them for where I'm going or where I already see myself. Like I, I say, thank you for the things that I am going to have, but I don't necessarily have yet. Um, I read another book that I put in the chat. It's called make your bed by, uh, Admiral, um, William McRaven. And, you know, I was in the Navy, so I'm a, I'm a military guy as well, but, um, he, he wrote this book after this, uh, commencement speech that he gave and it talked about completing a task. Like, how Pasha has her 10 before 10. My very first task is making my bed, is getting up, mm. making my bed, taking, even during COVID, taking a shower, brushing my teeth. You know, I'm not going anywhere. Sometimes I go to a gym if it's open, but it's just having, it gives me, a, a, it gets me in a routine and it gets me in that motion of, okay, now I'm completing a task. Uh, because being on the West Coast, you know, I wake up to a lot of different emails and things on the East Coast, right? So, um, uh, uh, just going uh, in and tackling uh, those. Uh, who done joined us? <laughs> Man, it's a Jamaican flag in the back. I love it because I'm Jamaican too. Oh, big up, big up. It's Independence Day, girl. You get it. Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. You all, it has been, oh, crazy. But that's okay because here I am. <laughs> Are we, gonna, are, are we okay to go over a little bit? <laughs> I, I, I think we can. I, I'm, I'm glad to have you. Let me just, Kenny, did you want to just end what you were saying there? <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> after an entrance like that, I'm done. <laughs> please, please. <laughs> that, that's what you, you learn how to make an interest when you're a Broadway diva. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, we're so glad that you have you here. I'm sure join us. We told the people that you you had a last minute work we did, but we also told them that Moesha is coming to Netflix. It's, there now. On, it's Netflix. There now. Yeah. it's, it's <laughs> on Netflix. And I, I, I find it so hard to believe that 20 years since the show ended, that show went straight to the top 10 of Netflix all yes. week long. Wow. All week long. Congratulations. That, that is fantastic. It really is. And yeah. I tell you, the, the, the fans, the viewers have been amazing. I feel like a very big star, the way they love me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been great. OK, so let me tell you, there have been like these age differences, right? When they're really young, like they're young now, they're like, oh, Miss Ralph. I love you, I love you. If they're older, like 35, 40, and they, they saw the show, they're saying things like, oh God, I hated you when I was younger. <laughs> but I love you now. I'm oh. a stepmother myself and I get it, I get it. So it's been, it's been absolutely wonderful. Absolutely That's amazing. amazing. So I'm loving it. Good, good. Well, you just popped in at the right time because we were just talking about tips to the audience about what inspired them to keep them going. And you know, one thing I learned from you years ago, and actually, happy Jamaican Independence Day. Is that today, right? That's oh, today, oh. baby. You see the flag behind I me? I see the flag. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But I'll start this out, uh, and I'll let you finish it, and you tell us what it means. If you stay ready. You don't have to get ready. And I don't care who the internet says started that, but Monique will tell you it was me <laughs> and her standing outside of the, of the stage. And one day she's turned around, she pulled up in her car and she said, Miss Ralph, you are always ready. And I said, girl, if you stay ready, you don't have to get ready because you never know when a camera is going to show up. We are up here on a set in Hollywood. Anybody could be anywhere. The cameras might be looking at us right now. And that was then when, of course, cameras aren't as prolific as they are now. I mean, 
-hmm. you better be sure that somebody's watching you somewhere, mm -hmm. sometime. There's a camera watching everything. And I know George Floyd is up in heaven is saying, thank you, God, for cameras <laughs> being everywhere. I know that's very yeah, true. Yes. You're, you're right about that. And you know, another topic that has um, come up a couple of times um, with our forums that we've been doing, and this is the fourth one, it's been really, really good. And we call it storming the castle, sometimes creating your own opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to talk about what did you do and what gave you the confidence that you do to create, to, to make them notice you or have a meeting with you to create et Etienne Toussaint of Designing Woman? Etienne Toussaint Bouvier, yes. <laughs> you know something, one of the, I, I've always been someone who was mentored and I, I was mentored well. There was always somebody grown with good sense before me that was willing to pour into me. Now this next person, I'm sure they wanted to pour into me, but anyway, they just gave me some good advice. His name was Robert De Niro. Mm -hmm. Robert De Niro and I are together doing a film called Mistress. And one day we are sitting in a car in between shots. And this man looks at me and he's like, you're like really good. It's like, you're like a, you're like a really great actress. And I'm, you know, I'm sitting there and I'm listening. I'm trying to figure out, okay, where's, where's this going? And he says, um, and that's too bad. I was like, oh shit, what? Because Hollywood is not looking for the black girl. So if you really want to make it in this industry, you better climb that mountain and wave that red flag and let them know that you're there because they are not looking for you and you should be found. And I was like, whoa. I mean, that was so many different things all at once. But what did I get out of it? One, I'm a great actress. And two, wave that red flag, let them know that you're there. So I've waved the red, red flag. And at times, sometimes, you know, you're waving the flag, letting people know that you're there, but sometimes it's not for you. Sometimes it's for somebody else. Sometimes mm. the flag is for somebody else to be seen because that's, that's what a flag bearer does. Mm. You know, the flag bearer is there to take the bullets, take the shots, and the next person will come back, come behind them. Hopefully they're as brave to carry the flag again, again for, whoa, I'm talking and it's making me feel like, whoo, because the Emmys this year nominated a record number of black performers saying that they're that meaning that they were they were seen they were found and i know what it was like not to be found i know what it was like to plant that flag and say we're here and we're ready so um but that's my spirit. I'm, I'm, I'm excited because the Emmys has also hired a black man to produce the Emmys, Reginald Hutman. How about that? Oh, awesome. didn't, brother, didn't they do the Oscars though? So they were in there. He mm. did the Oscars, yeah, so he did. He has done that as well. He's done so much, which is, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I, I admire him from afar. There you I admire go. I him from afar. I really do. That's great. I'm sorry, you done changed the floor. <laughs> 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 but 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 that's a good thing. That that's that's a good thing too. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a great thing. So let me ask you this here, because I think that this kind of you've had experience um, from your days on Broadway, mm -hmm. um, where you originated the role of Dina Jones, um, one which of is the, important the, because <laughs> everybody believes that Dream Girls started with the movie, and no. so many people don't know that it was a big hit of a Broadway show, very much like Hamilton is today. It was right. that kind of a hit. And it was through a, a very dark era for two reasons. One, I remember Broadway at that time, you had people doing drugs and no one on drugs on the street, no one wanted to go to Broadway, but they came to see Dream Girls. But then shortly after that, it was another epidemic that hit the AIDS and H HIV epidemic. Oh, yeah. and, um, and I know you always talk about that you've lost a lot of your friends. So I wanted you to talk about your foundation that you still have today. And how did you get through that, those dark times? 
You know something, for, for, it's interesting that you bring up what Broadway used to look like back mm -hmm. in the 80s, because they, people cannot imagine how dirty, nasty, and awful it was. You mm -hmm. know, what was, there was some television series that was on for a minute, and it showed very much what Broadway and Times Square was like at that time. It was horrible. But um, yeah, uh, we were on 45th Street, the Imperial Theater, where Ain't Too Proud to Beg, that's their home now, when Broadway reopens after COVID. But when AIDS hit, it was horrible. It was, it was nothing to be dancing with someone today. Tonight, we'd have a show, we're dancing, I'm looking at you, and the next day that person's gone. They would, they, it was like blowing candles out of, off of a birthday cake. These great, strong, beautiful young lives, gone. And people were horrible. People's response to them was horrible. People, people treated them like they were pariah. And I, 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 I'm thinking about it now and I get mad because I'm like, wait a minute. These are our friends. These are our coworkers. They're going to the hospital and you're gonna tell me you're not gonna go see them? You're not gonna go check up on them? Oh, it was terrible. And then when you look for your friends, they'd, some of them would have these signs on them that says, don't touch. Oh, it was horrible. And I remember that it was like the little church girl in me, the little church girl in me was like there, but for the grace of God, go I. And I can do better than this. And I was never taught who to hate. I was always taught who to love. So for me, it was a completely different response. But it was very difficult because not being a gay woman, not being a white man, people through that, I learned different levels of isms. You know, mm. it's like people were always trying to find somebody to dislike. I'll never forget the, the, the gay white man who was sick, who looked at me and said, why are you doing this? Nobody cares. And then the person looked at me and said, it's not like you're Sharon Stone. I'm like, God damn. I was like, that is nothing but the devil. It is nothing but the devil. But for me, you know, I, I had always seen black men pass away, black men and black women. I had, I had seen it so much. So for me in my head, it was never like a gay white man's disease because I was seeing so many brothers die. I was seeing my next door neighbor my childhood next door neighbor, she died. Sharon Red died. And there were other women. So for me, this was a black thing. This was a black people thing. And we were not getting the help. We were not getting the attention. And so I created Diva Simply Singing. And I said, everybody pay attention to a diva. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, we can knock it down with our purse, baby. Hey. <laughs> I said. Let me put on some big hair and call up these other women. And that's just what I did. Yes. And you believe it's like 30 years ago. So this year we will celebrate the 30th annual Diva Simply Singing virtually. And you are all invited. <laughs> all of you are invited. Hey, on Sunday nights, this Sunday, you can go and watch us on Facebook Live. Diva Simply Singing on our Facebook Live. And um, I, I do Diva Simply Quarantine, fabulous in isolation. And my guest at 7 p.m. is Jennifer Lewis. And we raise heaven and hell. Yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Cheryl, it sounds like um, you've, ta you've talked about a few different ways in which you've like pivoted and transitioned over the course of your career. And some of the things that we talked about um, prior to you joining with our other panelists was, you know, some of the tools and some of the things that they implement into their lives to help um, them keep inspired and also um, help them keep reinventing themselves for success. Can you talk about some of those things uh, really quickly about, you know, maybe give three ways in which you have 
or three things that you do daily that um, you've implemented into your life that help you keep real? I look, I look in the mirror. <laughs> I love myself. <laughs> yes. I love me. I love me. I love me when um, I'm having difficult times. I remember that I love me. I love me when I'm having ha happy times. I remember that I love me. I love myself when I'm feeling ignored or overlooked. I remember that I'm wonderful. I remember, I also believe that there is something much greater than me. There's a much higher power than me that I don't, I, I swear to God, God must be a woman because too many perfect things happen. <laughs> God must be a woman because why would we have an orange man in the White House <laughs> who is such a horrible human being but he's so horrible, he has yanked the covers off of everything that has been going on nasty underneath the skirt mm -hmm. of America. Mm -hmm. If that orange man wasn't there, we would not be seeing the real fights that we need to fight. Yes. So mm -hmm. I, okay, thank you. That, a woman did that. So thank you, great goddess in the sky. <laughs> and I, I keep believing, I, I keep, I have hope, I have faith. I believe in the things that everybody else says is impossible. I know it's possible. I know it's possible because like Cinderella said, impossible things are happening every day. And why shouldn't possible things happen for me? Right. I look at my children, two of the greatest watermelons I ever pushed out of my body. <laughs> I, I, I just, I look at them and I know I've done at least two things very well. And I know I'm not the best housekeeper. I'm here in quarantine with my husband and he still loves me. So the way he looks at me, I know I'm doing something else right. Call the <laughs> housekeeper, right. <laughs> and, and, and your husband, uh, being a politician, and you, you have your own voice as well. What would you encourage people to do in November, November 2nd, I believe? Don't play with me. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. Thank you. I love but, it. <laughs> yes. I need you to vote like your life depends on it. Because if it we're going to have to wear masks, I need you to spread the message and not the disease. And if you want one, go to my Instagram and follow the link, baby, and order yours and spread the message. <laughs> I need you to vote. It's, yeah. it's, it's critical. It is. it is so critical. I And I don't need you to just vote, but I need you to make sure you are registered to vote. I need you to double check on your mom and cousins and them and make sure that they are ready and correct to vote. Yeah. I need you, if you're able, to arrange a way to get people to the polls. If you've got extra time on your hand or you know some old folks that are just going to sit around anyway, I need you to get them to the polls to man the polls. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough people to man the polls. I need you to get people to the registrar if they're going to vote by mail because that orange man is trying to F up the post office. Mm -hmm. We should not be standing for this mess. Get all your friends, tell them, vote by mail. Make sure they've got their absentee vote together now and get them to the registrar. Mm -hmm. Can I also interject just to say one other thing too? And that's to also make sure you've done your census to be counted because a lot of the voter suppression is happening in certain neighborhoods because they're not being counted. So right. therefore they're saying, oh, well, this is only the number amount of people. So you're going to have one voting machine in your area when it's 100 mm -hmm. people that live there. Um, and and to, yeah. let me piggyback on what he just said. It seems as though from something mat crazy machinations from the orange monster, they may be cutting back on the amount of time that you've got to fill out the census. They have. Meaning, they are, they've cut it off in September. That's why yep. I was saying that. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So. I'm telling you, vote With, like your life depends on it. Yeah. Fill out the census. Thank you. We're gonna. I know we we're 
a little running a little bit behind, which is fine because we had to make sure Miss Cheryl Leaf. Oh my gosh, we're Thank so you. glad you were able to join us. Um, I did want to take a couple questions um, from our Q and A because um, they're starting to pile in. Um, Pasha, can you tell us what product or service that you took five hundred dollars and turned it into a multi million dollar business? Well, back then it was, believe it or not, long distance. That was back, so it was a service back then. So I was in the, the, the long distance arena, but now I market health and wellness products. Uh, I took my CMOS this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. CMOS, Jamaican CMOS is the best. Yes. The best. <laughs> Um, and then I, I think Kenny, maybe you can, you can answer this or Andre, um, how do you feel about virtual events? And as a fabric solution company, I don't really see a lot of opportunity. This is someone that has, that's a vendor. Um, maybe there's a green screen order here and there for a few drapes to mask off certain areas. For those of you that have a V equipment, it might make more sense. What, what's the panel's thoughts overall about virtual events? And I'm, I'm assuming monetizing those events. So uh, I'll, just really, I'll be quick, Andre, I promise you. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the music space right now, there are a lot of companies that are starting virtual uh, shows. Um, I had one of my artists actually, we did one, there's a new company called FanPass. Um, I mean, I, I've honestly seen about 10 of them that have popped up in the last month to month and mm -hmm. a half. Um, I'm still not sure about the, the maximizing the monetary value because touring, there's merchandising, there's, you know, meet and greets. Like I can sell VIP tickets or regular tickets and things like that, but I can do it in multiple cities. Then I can do after parties and such, right? So on one night, just using Ro Timmy, who's an R&B singer as an example, um, he gets about 10 to 15,000 per show. That's not including merch or an after party, but I can probably clear closer to 20 to 25,000 a night with him on a show. So with me doing one virtual show, I'm charging maybe $10 a ticket um, just because, you know, people have been going through a rough time. A lot of people aren't working and I don't want to isolate his fan base. So we're trying to figure out because a lot of sponsors haven't really jumped on these yet either because you get a lot of money from that. You know, sponsors cover a lot of uh, expenses for touring, which is how you end up getting, you know, your overall getting into the black and not in the red. Uh oh. Um, and so wrote to me, I said, hi. Oh, I will. I will. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I'm not really sure about them, Andre. I'm not sure about just the, the, you know, throwing the events in that space, yeah. but just from a musical standpoint, I'm still kind of being patient, understanding where I'm going to pivot at some point. Pasha, I got your pivot down. <laughs> um, but right now we're just kind of watching to see who's doing what and who's really going to be around for the long run with this. Cause mm -hmm. I don't know if we'll be able to do a real concert until maybe 2022 to be quite honest with the way yeah. It's yeah i think the virtual events um they're meeting us they're meeting us where we are now so i think it's a band-aid and it's something that we should all um participate in and um i think we should take it a little further and if we can kind of do a hybrid you know especially for events you know i'm in a, a world where people want to touch feel hug see the beauty and a lot of times you can't with the virtual you know so we're we're just doing what we need to do and uh, meeting everyone where they are now but uh I, I don't really see the longevity and i also think that a lot of people you know are getting um a little tired so i think you have to make your virtual event um amazingly fun and you have to have people like you miss ralph that just you know, you're fun and you're interesting because you'll lose the attention of people and they fall off. So I think when you're thinking about a virtual event, you got to make sure it's different and it's engaging and all of those things. But um, I, I agree, Kenny, and uh, on the financial piece of it all. But you know, I'm going to jump in on that too for just a second, Mina, because that person said that they're in fabrication. So yeah. that means they're dealing in with material and fabric. Start creating napkins, start creating and, and, and marketing um, placemats, start creating masks. You don't have to just stay in the industry. You have to, to broaden your scope of thinking, which is yeah. basically what we're talking about, reinventing yourself. Because if yes. you're in fabrics, the fabric market here in Los Angeles, and we have one of the largest ones, they're still in business and people are still creating things. Head wraps, yeah. 
um, throws and, you know, um, cause this one here would take a piece of fabric and. <laughs> <laughs> also you can make I won't tell you what's <laughs> behind here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, so that's, and I think that's one of the purposes of what we're talking about um, for that question. And I saw it earlier, you have to think beyond the scope of where you're doing, seeing things that are not as though they are and find opportunities for them. Yeah, and also gifting is really big right now. You know, right. I love to do a virtual event and send everyone a gift because at least you have their attention, you know, yeah. and you can do a beautiful patch, Mina and wrap. You can do a lot of things with your fabric yeah. when it comes to yeah. that. You can create well, I'll remember a that for divas. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. You can give that away as a favor. A virtual <laughs> swag bag. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 You can create a bag and in the bag have napkins, um, um, plates, match everything that people need to do to entertain at home. Come well, on. I'll tell you this too, um, as, just speaking of monetizing digital events, that's the kind of space that I've been in for a while. And there's so many different ways to do it. And the first thing to understand is right now where we're going, everything is starts with an app. So, and it, then it, the app normalizes the process. So let me give you an example. It was really, it used to be strange getting in a car with a stranger. But now with an app called Uber or Lyft, everybody's jumping in these cars with strangers like we did in the past. And back, it used to be taboo to do that. And so now the app changed the game. The same thing with Uber Eats, having people that you've never met in your life drop food off to you. It was weird at first, but guess what? Now people are doing it. Even trying on clothes, you can do that with an app now. They scan your body. You're able to try on an outfit, even real estate now. Real estate is being done virtually through apps. So now instead of going to tour a home, you're able to virtually tour the home and it almost feels as though you're there. In addition, I have some friends that have created, you know, where you're able to the virtual reality now. So for concerts and things where you're able to almost feel like you're actually there because you have these things on and you can see the person next to you. There are even virtual things where you can go on campus and learn and you'll have your own little avatar where you actually are able to take your avatar, walk into a classroom, sit beside somebody and learn. So the whole world of virtual learning is going in a new direction. So for me, it's a matter of teaching people how to monetize that. So when I first started, I remember when I did my first course launch and that's just teaching people certain things online. I made $18,000 in the first day in one day of promoting that course launch because I was teaching something that people wanted to learn. I have a friend who's in the hair industry. So prior to that, she was making hair and you know she had a physical, um, a physical office, well, on uh, well, not office, but a physical um, um, business. But she took that concept and she literally sold nine hundred thousand dollars worth of hair in twenty four hours on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So why am I sharing that with you? It doesn't matter what you're doing. This is a digital world and people now are starting to understand that that's the direction the world is going in. And I can take it to a whole nother level, even with digital currency, because that's a whole nother level of some of the stuff that we're doing. But every single day, you know, my husband and I, we will sit home and literally earn thousands of dollars every single day from this, from mm -hmm. our phone. This is, the, this is the single most powerful thing in my opinion, that's been invented in the past decade for entrepreneurs who really understand that if you understand how to take your phone through apps or through digitizing whatever your career path is or your talent is, you can literally become wealthy just by understanding how to create a digital product, a digital course, uh, an e-commerce store and whatever your product is, be able to set up that store, send traffic to that store and have people all around the world buying your product and you're making money off of that. And it doesn't even cost a whole lot of uh, upfront money to start. It. Wow. That's um, so make sure you leave all your contact information. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's a message. Yeah. And, 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 uh, yeah, and, and Cheryl, the person, the person says she wants to show you a Jamaican flag mask. The one who that has the fabric um, company. That's what they said they want to do. Well, thank you. Tell them, make, take a good look at the flag <laughs> on and send it to you for me because you'll make sure I get it. And, and just to tag on to that, Pasha, which was absolutely incredible about the apps. But um, I know someone else that when COVID first started, they didn't create an app 
all they did, they just picked up a book that they had wrote and just started reading chapters out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah hey, that's called and, content. content is how, how did that work out for you, Cheryl? <laughs> like she said, it's called content. Yeah. What happened was the response was so great to my reading the book that people were asking, where's the Audible book? Well, there is a place, there's an app called Audible. <laughs> and uh, we are now getting ready to launch the second edition of the Audible book. And it'll probably be available around mid-October. So the second edition book is coming. And as fate would have it, I own the rights. The, mm. I own the audio rights to my book. Mm. So Ownership. Thank you. Ownership <laughs> is everything. Ownership if, is everything. If I knew what I know now, I would have never sold my rights to Dream Girls for a dollar. I'd have never mm. done it. Mm. Ownership is yeah. everything. So I know we're, we're at 4.30. Um, and <laughs> so we could go on forever because you guys are all amazing. And I I'm, I'm, no, I'm learning a lot. Uh, before you before you close, uh, Cheryl Rotimi said, "Tell her she makes being an artist look easy. Bless her." I'm just passing oh. that message. And sorry, Nina, but go ahead. Okay. Oh, thank you. I want his new song to be on Diva Simply Singing virtually. Thank you. In December, I know that you will make sure it happens, won't you? Thank you in advance. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> done. 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 So just, just to go around, um, if each of you guys can kind of just, you know, give some closing remarks to our audience, um, some takeaways, some tips, you know, on the, all what we talked about, about reinventing yourself for success. Um, I'll start with Andre. Well, this has been wonderful. You know, it's uh, 7.30 out here in, in East Coast land, D.C. Yes. But um, I just want to motivate everyone. Just, you know, take this pause. Not many people have ever had a pause in life and figure out who you are, who you want to be, where you want to go. Stay positive, know that you can do it. Think about your skill set and mm. pivot toward that. Mm. Awesome. Kenny? Um, I would say just be consistent. Uh, don't stop, you know, consistent strategies and consistent mindsets breed success, um, you know, and love and believe in yourself. Uh, you know, there'll be people that'll come into your life that'll just try to throw curveballs at you and get you to pull this way and that way. But if you truly believe in your vision of what you're doing, you need to see yourself already achieving what you're out to do. But you got to see it and believe it. And then, you know, it's going to happen for you. Tasha? Well, I would say we have to support each other oh. more than ever before. We have yes. to shine the light on other people, other brothers and sisters out there more than ever before. I honestly feel like the opportunity for black people in America, the time is now because they're, all the eyeballs are on us. There's so much money that's out there. There's so much opportunity out there. And I honestly feel that there's a renaissance that's taking place. And there are gonna be two types of people, those who understand it and they're able to, to capitalize and profit off of that and help people walk through the door and understand the time that we're in and, and not shy away from that. And, and as uh, um, Kenny just said, understanding that everybody's not gonna be your fan. Everybody's not gonna support you, but you cannot, um, you got to understand that people with no dreams, it's easy for them to try to kill yours because they don't have value in dreams. Ooh. So you got to understand that when you have whatever that dream is, you connect that dream to a grind. Everybody has a dream, but everybody doesn't have a grind. So if every single day you can get up and work and work and understand that, like uh, Cheryl talked about our uh, ownership, understanding that ownership that you have, you know, my thing is I would rather work and grind 24 seven for myself than slave nine to five for somebody else. And that's the attitude that we have to have going beyond 2020, understanding the power of owning our own stuff. Because as long as somebody else owns our stuff, they're always pulling up the things, they're always dangling the cat carrot in front of us. And when we start to understand the power of ownership, and most importantly, the power of supporting each other, doing business with each other. We've got to stop stuff like saying, if someone who, I've heard this and I just, I don't want to ramble, but I want to just, I got to put this out there. 
we've got to stop saying things like if somebody that's black messes up, well, I'm not doing per, uh, business with, the, with them anymore. I'm not doing any, I'm not hiring another black event planner. I'm not going to another black dentist. You've never heard anybody white say that. They have never said if somebody white messes up their teeth, I'm not going to another white dentist. We're the Thanks. only people that I hear saying that we've got to stop that. We've got to start supporting each other. We've got to start giving each other first chance, second chance, third chance, and fourth and fifth chance. And if we don't continue to support and love each other, then we're not going to grow. So I say, like we've all talked about, this is the beginning. I love bringing it all to the table, having that real conversation and opening up and learning. Find you a mentor. Go after your dreams. Don't let anybody stop you. And don't think there's a shortage of money because I'm telling you right now, in every downturn, right now, America is in the biggest place for the most opportunity. Capitalize on it and don't mm -hmm. let this pass you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a whole sermon right there, baby. <laughs> everything she just said. Everything she just said. <laughs> the thing about it is, is what she just said sounds like it's complicated, but it's so simple, mm. it's complicated. Yes. Because you really, really have to know that you're worth it. Mm -hmm. You really <laughs> have to know that you deserve it. You really have to know that you can do it. Those things, they sound simple, but they're complicated for people. Yes. I get up and look in the morning and I love me. Mm. I, lo I can't wait to love on me some more. Mm. People, there are some people out there that say, what's wrong with her? Why, sh why she love herself like that? In my mind, I can't figure out how not to love myself mm. like that. Like the song says, sometimes you've got to encourage yes. yourself. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to speak victory yes, over the test. Yeah. Because no matter what you're going through, Oh, honey, please don't get me started. <laughs> you just need to know that sometimes the help that you need is right at the end of your own arm. Mm. It is right there. That's the help that you need. And if I can do it, you better get yourself a mentor that's willing to extend and pull you up and take you with them. I like to stand in the sunshine because I want to make sure that I get a whole lot of friends to stand in the sunshine with me and feel how good it feels to be fabulous. So just put on your lipstick, put on your makeup, throw away your fears and go for your dreams. But you gotta have a dream to make a dream come true. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so how did your mother tell you to put on your lipstick? Oh, oh my God, wait. I just happen to have some right here. Watch. <laughs> oh my gosh this is so amazing thank you guys so much for your time today we've learned so much from you guys i know that all of our guests um our attendees you know just from the chat it's on fire they're all you know really excited and thank you guys for motivating them but as Cheryl has up, please go out and vote. William, did you want to? Cheryl, what are the, where can they buy those in your other mask, um, Diva? Okay. Where? If you want the vote, the vote mask that Bernice King wore at John Lewis's home going, please go to my Instagram and follow the link in my bio. All of the masks are on there. This one has the Afro head in it because the power of the Black female vote let me tell you, she is the linchpin.